first, before we get started, Stuart, talk, let's talk about where Slack came from, how you came up with the idea. This isn't your first rodeo. You created a, a well-known product called Flickr. Mm -hmm. Very few entrepreneurs can do it once, let alone twice. So if you just take us through the origin of you know, Flickr and then, and then Slack and, and why we're here. All right, well, so the bad news is that um, they're close to impossible to replicate. Both are kind of uh, pivots from failed massively multiplayer games. So it's the kind of thing that I think if you start off with the intent to build a failed massively multiplayer game, you may not end up with, with a product like this. But um, there's something common to both of those failed games, Flickr and Slack. And that comes from um, an experience I had 25 years ago, so it's 1992. Um, it's my first year of college. One of the things we had to do was go down to the basement computer lab in the Clara Hugh building at the University of Victoria and get our accounts on the school's Unix machine. So I got that, and this is a couple years before the web, uh, or maybe a year and a half before the web really took off. So the things on the internet were Usenet, Talk, IRC, email, and I could use email to talk to to friends who had gone off to different colleges. Um, but Usenet kind of just blew my mind, this directory of uh, news group topics, kind of like a bulletin board. And this was like 90% of the traffic on the internet in the days before the web. In fact, rec.music.gdead, or the Grateful Dead um, <laughs> discussion group was like the Netflix of its time. It was like 40% of, of internet traffic. And the thing that was so exciting to me was the use of computing technology to facilitate human interaction, which was kind of really brand new. Uh, that you could transcend geography, that you could, could you know, transcend um, the the way in which you grew up and find these people who could be in different time zones on different continents but shared the same interests as you. So it might not seem connected, um, but uh, over the next couple of years, when the web came to prominence, I taught myself HTML, I got a job as a web designer. In the first days of blogging, I was really avid, you know, maybe from 99 through 2002 or something like that. And all this early um, online community, the kind of birth of social software, you know, now we're at the point where everyone has these fancy phones in their pocket. You can communicate with anyone on the surface of the planet, literally at the speed of light. And what are we going to do with that technology? So we, as a again, as a species, kind of stumbling our way, trying different things, experimenting. But I think we're still in the really early stages. So when I say we wanted to try and make a game, I think what people think is like, or like a guy with a sword fighting a dragon or something like that. This was much more taking those early virtual communities and putting them into the context of play. Really collaborative, um, a lot of social interaction, one world that was shared, and the point of the game was kind of to evolve the world. There's a book by the theologian James Carse called Finite and Infinite Games, and the first line of the book, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but there are two kinds of games. One is played for the purpose of winning, um, those are finite games, and then infinite games, which are played for the purpose of continuing the play. So that was really our inspiration. Turns out, a little bit hard to explain, a little bit lofty, not super commercially viable. Um, so, especially in 2002, which is when we started the first company, you sure, you know, you remember this time, we had the dot-com crash, we had WorldCom and Enron, the big accounting scandals, 9-11. Mm -hmm. uh, it was just like a disaster moment, kind of black economy. Um, the NASDAQ had fallen 80% from its peak, and no one wanted to fund a, anything on the internet at all, but especially not something whimsical like a game. And we were looking for something that we could get to market quicker, because the game was really complex and ambitious, but that would take advantage of the technology we'd already developed. That turned out to be Flickr. It's kind of a whole story there, which we can gloss over. Um, Flickr got bought by Yahoo in 2005. Myself um, and the whole team went to go work there. And then uh, 2009, at the beginning of the year, I was out, um, and three of those original Flickr team members still at Yahoo, we all decided to leave and to start a new company to build a web-based massively multiplayer game. This time we couldn't fail. Technology had advanced. Servers were really cheap compared to 2002. Way more people online. We were all better at what we did. There's all this great open source software. Um, the network had spread you know, from a couple people having dial-up at home to more or less ubiquitous broadband and uh, failed again. But we spent three and a half years on it, and we had a really 
a cross-disciplinary team. We had um, creative people, artists, animators, writers, musicians on the one hand, and then we had more traditional software development team, back-end programming, technical operations. We had um, customer support, business operations, and we used one of those technologies that I first discovered back in 1992, IRC, or Internet Relay Chat, as the foundation for how we communicated at the company. And IRC has this one fundamental concept called a channel. And you send messages to the channel rather than to individuals or to groups of individuals as you do in email or most messaging systems. And that's a, it's a fundamental shift because the channel can exist before you arrive and it can exist after you leave. You can look into other channels across the system. Um, when you join the organization, you know, whether it's the next day or six months later or five years later, all of that stuff is archived in all, in all these different channels. And we slowly, over the course of years, built feature after feature, solved the really irritating problems, took advantage of the obvious opportunities. And so fast forward now to 2012, end of the year, it was apparent that the game wasn't going to work. Like It just wasn't going to be viable again. It was never going to be the kind of business that would justify the 17 million bucks of venture capital investment we had raised. Um, but we all realized we would never work without a system like this one again. And so thought that it might be something that the rest of the world would want. And I still remember going to Andreessen Horowitz, one of our investors, and telling them this is what we we're going to do and saying, you know, we think that there's a big market for this. We think over the next 10 years, that kind of at the fullness of time, this could be $100 million in revenue. This could be a billion dollar company. And they, I'm sure they remembered this differently, but we're like, whatever. And uh, we blew past that a couple years after launching. So uh, the demand has been much bigger than we would have thought. And I think we've sort of accidentally discovered something that is there's for which there's a lot of latent demand.